And what I intend to lead is a political revolt, a turning of our backs on the political status quo. It doesn't work. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Now, we put out the operations notice for today under the title Emergency Election Announcement. And we did that because we think this election needs a bit of gingering up. Thus far, it is the dullest, most boring election campaign we have ever seen in our lives. And it's funny because the more the two big party leaders try to be different, the more they actually sound the same. Uh, we've reached such ridiculous uh, levels uh, that we saw yesterday on the Conservatives' social media a post about the cross-channel illegal migration crisis with Starmer's got no plan, the Tories have reduced cross-channel migrants by 36%. So they've even come to lying because it's now up nearly 30% this year. Um, so Keir Starmer overnight, of course, on this big issue of immigration, says that they are going to cut the numbers. He, of course, the man who campaigned, not just for a second referendum, but a believer in open borders, uh, and a man who was a lawyer, fought very, very hard for those that arrive on the back of lorries to get benefits once they got here. So, frankly, we're in a situation, I think, where nobody believes a word that they say, no one's listening, people are zoned out, and right at the minute... None of the above is top of the polls by a country mile. And the problem with all this is we know whoever wins, taxes will remain high. The highest tax burden since 1948. Everyone's promising not to put taxes up, but nobody talks about reducing the tax burden. We also know that our people are getting poorer. Yes, we had growth in the economy. The last set of figures were slightly better than before. GDP, they call it. We must all bow down to the god of GDP. We know that people will get poorer, but we also know that crime or fear of crime will get worse. London, even the wealthier parts of London, have been transformed over the course of the last few years. Crime is so bad now that people generally don't even bother to report it. But it's OK, you can go shoplifting and nick up to 200 quids worth of kit before anybody is even going to prosecute you. And these are all symptoms of a country that actually is in decline. We're in economic decline in relative terms. Oh, sure, we're doing better than our former partners in the European Union, but we're massively behind America and many other parts of the world. We're in social decline, and we're actually in a form of moral decline. We've forgotten who we are as a country. We heard a very impassioned speech by Keir Starmer this morning about D-Day, and he talked about his own brother serving on HMS Antelope in the Falklands. And he spoke, actually, with a great degree of passion. But here's a little statistic that sums up what's been wrong with our ruling classes. On Thursday of this week, there'll be massive international commemorations of D-Day, something in which the British played an extraordinary part, something which we can be just immensely proud of in terms of what we were able to organise, able to do, and the courage that people showed. But can you believe a poll out last week showed that 52% of 18 to 34-year-olds don't even know what D-Day is? And that's what you get when you're led by a career political class that don't really care about the country, that are embarrassed to say anything that could be seen to be vaguely patriotic. Oh, we're told that Michael Gove and others have improved the education system. Well, I'll tell you what, if over half of our young people in this country do not know about an event that is within living memory and which should be one of the proudest things this nation has ever managed to achieve, something I think is fundamentally wrong at every level. The centre of gravity on every national debate has moved hugely to the left since 2010, when David Cameron and George Osborne took power. So we re represent a very different kind of politics. We believe that the Westminster political class are now more detached from ordinary folk than they were even before that referendum stunned everybody back all those years ago now in 2016. Something has gone very, very wrong. 
What we also know is the election is over. It's done. Labour have won the election. There is not a contest. There is a big MRP poll coming out on Sky News at five o'clock that will confirm all the things that we've seen before. Whether the Conservatives get 80 seats or 150 seats is now almost irrelevant. Starmer has won this election. And that's my fear. Nothing will change. Maybe things will get ever so slightly worse. Now, I stood here a week ago and I said, look, hands up. I've been nonplussed by Rishi calling a short-term election. Doesn't give me the time to fight a constituency. Doesn't give me the time to build up data. I thought the rational thing to do was not to stand, but to do my bit, as I put it, supporting the country around the party. And for the last week, that is what I've been doing. I've been travelling all around the country. I've had the honour of appearing with Piers Morgan on Question Time, amongst other things. Uh, I've been to Dover to talk about the migrant crisis that I alone, I alone predicted four and a half years ago. But more importantly, I've been out on the streets meeting an awful lot of people, and interestingly, a lot of young people. And I'll tell you this, and you won't have got this yet, and the pollsters won't yet have picked this up, but I promise you, after 30 years of experience in this game, something is happening out there. There is a rejection of the political class going on in this country in a way that has not been seen in modern times. But the other thing that really shook me in a way last week were the number of people coming up to me on the street saying, Nigel, why aren't you standing? And I gave my logical, rational reasons for it. But I couldn't help, after each exchange, I simply couldn't help feeling that somehow they felt I was letting them down. That I wasn't standing up for these people. People in their millions who've stood with me in some cases for many, many years. Election battles, referendums. And I guess I have been a champion for many of those people. I took the day off yesterday, had a normal day. Walked the dogs, did a bit of fishing, popped into the pub, you know, a normal sort of day, which gave me time to think and reflect. And I began to feel a terrible sense of guilt even if it is very difficult for me to find a parliamentary constituency. And it is hard. It is true. The one time I did stand and fight, the Conservative Party cheated against me in such a way that one of the party agents got a nine-month prison sentence, suspended. But, of course, the result stood. So all those things have been weighing on my mind. But difficult though it is, I can't let down those millions of people. I simply can't do it. It would be wrong. So I have decided... I've changed my mind. It's allowed, you know. It's not always a sign of weakness. It could potentially be a sign of strength. So I am going to stand in this election. I'll be launching my candidacy at midday tomorrow in the Essex seaside town of Clacton. So midday tomorrow, Clacton, at the end of the pier. Um, but perhaps... Perhaps more important than that, I've made, a, I've made a far bigger decision than that, which is, and I've talked to Richard, and he is happy about it, oh, of course, you'll write your pieces about how badly we're all getting on, because that's journalism for you. Actually, I, I, I regret to say we're getting on quite well. <laughs> but Richard is more than happy for me to put my head and shoulders firmly over the parapet and take the flak. So I'm coming back as leader of Reform UK, but not just for this election campaign. I'm coming back for the next five years. And there is one very simple reason for that. We all know already that the Conservative Party will be in opposition. But it won't be the opposition. They are incapable of it. They've spent most of the last five years fighting each other rather than standing up and fighting for the interests of this country. They are split down the middle on policy, and frankly right now, they don't stand for a damn thing. 
So our aim in this election is to get many, many millions of votes. And I'm talking far more votes than you got back in 2015, when we, when we got four million votes. We're going to get many, many, many more votes than that. How many seats in Parliament can we win under this system? Well, that's another matter. And that depends on what momentum we can get from here. When people start to realise in the red wall, with reform second to Labour, when they start to realise that actually in those seats, it's a Conservative vote that's a vote for Labour. It's a Conservative vote that is a wasted vote. Then I think we might just surprise everybody. And I know that you all think that our votes will simply come from the Conservatives and they'll get crushed. Believe me, this Conservative Party under Rishi Sunak, who nobody ever voted for, not even the Conservative Party members voted for, this party needs no help in being crushed. It's crushed itself already. And those people who already say they'll vote reform, very few of them would go back to the Conservatives even if we stood down. So we are appealing to Conservative voters. We are appealing to Labour voters. And those commentators and journalists that are longer in the tooth might remember that in 2015, against all predictions, we took more votes from the Labour Party that we took from the Conservative Party. So, Keir Starmer, yes, he'll win, but, but we, we're absolutely going to make sure his percentage is a lot smaller than it is now. But perhaps above all, what we're appealing to are those who intend not to vote, because they don't believe there's anybody within the Westminster establishment that actually stands up for them. Very often they're people running small businesses, acting as sole traders. They run a plumbing company, they run a taxi company, whatever it is. They know when they're right that nobody in Westminster is on their side. Nobody in Westminster even understands what they do. And what we're going to put forward over the next few years are men and women that will stand for us, represent us, who've got real life experience. To us, this is not just an extension of being in the Oxford Union. It isn't just some great big game. It's actually about our country and its people. And we're worried and we're fearful of many of the impacts that we've seen. We find what happened after those local elections just a few weeks ago of candidates winning in Leeds, in Burnley, in Bradford and elsewhere, standing, shouting, Alawa Akbar, standing, shouting, we are coming to get you, the birth of sectarian politics in our country, caused by massively irresponsible immigration policies. And it was the Labour Party that opened the door. And who would have believed that a Conservative Party would have accelerated it? To anyone that says to me, well, surely you won't stand against Bill Bloggs, because he's a really good bloke and he was a Brexiteer, the answer is 2.4 million. 2.4 million people, this Conservative government, have allowed to settle in the UK in the course of the last two years. So whether Bill Bloggs is a good bloke or not, he has actually been part of what is a massive betrayal of 17.4 million people who voted Brexit. They voted yes to get back our independence, but they absolutely voted to get back control of our borders. And Richard said earlier that this is the immigration election, but it is. We have to build a new house every two minutes just to accommodate those that are legally, legally coming in to Britain. The impact on the health service, the impact on infrastructure, on everything else. We have to get a grip. It is the major issue of our times. The population explosion has devalued the life of ordinary Britons in just the most extraordinary way. And even if those in Westminster don't know it, I promise you that those outside of it do. Now I want to pay tribute to Richard who has kept this party going during times when he was told there was no need for it. No need for it. Boris has an 80 seat majority, they're going to deliver Brexit and everything, everything that Brexit voters wanted. Well Richard has kept this going at great personal cost in terms of time and money. I'm very pleased to say Richard from this moment is going to be chairman of this party and, I hope, is going to spend as much time in Boston and Skegness whilst I'm taking the flak 
Um, so we can go up there and win that constituency. And I think back, actually, in Boston, Richard, to 2015, when UKIP put up a 21-year-old candidate who was a bit, bit green, to say the least. He got 15,000 votes. I'm sure you're going to get many, many more than that. So the really big message here is what I'm really calling for and what I intend to lead is a political revolt. Yes, a revolt. A turning of our backs on the political status quo. It doesn't work. Nothing in this country works anymore. The health service doesn't work. The roads don't work. None of our public services are up to scratch. We are in decline. This will only be turned around with boldness. We will only recover our position through economic growth. That will only come when we get away from just half a dozen multinationals dominating the thought of our politicians and allowing real entrepreneurship to flourish. So we're very, very much on the side of the little guy and woman. We're very much on the side of creating growth. We're very much on the side of ending the poisoning of our education system where 50% of young people don't even know what D-Day is. So make no mistake, we are unashamedly patriotic. We believe that it's right to put the interests of British people first. We believe Brexit needs to be implemented properly, and we are going to be the voice of opposition. And I tell you what, I've done it before. I'll do it again. I'll surprise everybody. Thank you.